Welcome to this FEI Coach webinar. I'm Gareth Marr. I'm delighted to be joined by the staff of the Republic of Ireland Under 15s team, uh, head coach and uh, coach educator Jason Dunhu, assistant coach Will Doyle, and assistant coach Sean St. Ledger. Thanks for joining us, lads. Um, Jay, can just start with you before we get stuck into your topic. Um, you've had a long career in coaching. Um, can we just kind of briefly kind of skim over? Um, we'll be going to be here all day, I suppose, because you've been in so long. Like, you know, how you got involved and how you got to this stage? Yeah, um, obviously, uh, I, I was playing at amateur level only. I didn't try to go up to the League of Ireland or anything like that. But I got the book for coaching quite young. And I would have done my first old introduction course when I was 16 years of age and moved on to my B license by 18. So I've been coaching, uh, coaching nearly 30 years now at all different stages, grassroots, um, where I spent a, a long spell there into interleague, into national league, into, into professional international level all the time as well. So um, yeah, it's been good. I really enjoy it. I love it. Uh, I think I'm a better coach than I was a player. So I get better satisfaction out of it. Um, and I, I, I enjoy, I just enjoy helping players develop, to be perfectly honest with you, Gary. Uh, Will, for yourself, you, you played League of Ireland and you moved into coaching uh, then as well, uh, mastermind and Wexford Youth Women's winning the Women's National League and doing great work there and, and obviously doing great work now in terms of international coaching set up. You know, how has that transition been for you in terms of playing the coaching? Yeah, I think it was a, a massive uh, obviously point for my career was going from playing League of Ireland football, getting the job within the FEI and then going into the coaching structure. Same as Jason, I would have started very young. Um, I did my old youth cert through the PFEI um, back when I was playing, when I was about 20 years of age. Then went on through the coaching ladder, UEFA B in 2007, up to the UEFA A in 2013. And obviously all through that, I was building to get through the Elite Youth A license, which I completed two years ago, thankfully. Um, but all through that uh, process, the coach education pathway has really helped me to develop the whole way from the start, working with local teams into the county squads within Wexford and then obviously building up to going to the Champions League with Wexford Youth Women as well before stepping into international football. Sean, you're probably relatively new to the to coach education set up in, in terms of recently doing your UEFA A licence. Uh, you had a very uh, not really noticeable career, like you only scored in the European Championships in 2012 and, you know, played for Ireland a couple of times and played with Kaká and MLS and stuff like that. So not really a career to note, like, but um, how have you found the switch to coaching? Um, quite difficult, really. Um, obviously, playing is really easy. You know, you, everyone does everything for you. And then you come into coaching and um, I can remember one of my first sessions when I come into the under-15s. Um, I just thought that I was going to be shadowing Jason and Will and um, Jason takes the session and then um, he throws me the um, start watching the whistle goes there you go and I looked at him and I froze and um, I didn't know what to do and because obviously the coaching process is completely new to me and it was fine playing in front of thousands of people but then in front of like 7, 13 to 14 year old lads I froze I didn't know what to say dry mouth <laughs> etc and then that was like um, a welcoming to the under 15s but obviously since then you know I've really enjoyed it and it's been a, a huge learning curve and you know fantastic to learn from from these two from these two people who have been coaching for so long. Jay that's very reassuring for grassroots coaches is it to hear that isn't it someone who scored you know like important calls for Ireland and had a great career but still gets those butterflies the same way any grassroots coach would. Yeah, and I, I'd, be, I'd be very civil. I know I'm coaching for a long time, but even when I'm on the pitch, you still have butterflies. You know, is the session going to be good enough for the players? The players going to enjoy it? Are they going to have some fun? Are they going to learn? All that comes to it. It's, um, it's different when you step onto the pitch as a coach. It's so different, you know. There's so much going through your mind, you know. You, you want to make sure it's a good experience for the players, and that's what we try to do at air level. And that's, as a coach educator, that's where I try to get across to the coaches that might fall into my micro groups. It's, you know, first thing you got to do is make sure the players want to come back every day, every week. Because then if they do come back, you know they, they're enjoying the process. So you're doing something right. We'll always increase our knowledge in, in education uh, in football. We'll increase our knowledge every day. But the main thing is, are the players enjoying what they're doing with you? That's the key. That, that's that must the be unique that you, you try to bring into what you do with the 15s then as well. 
it's a it, well hopefully in this presentation today we'll get across our ethos our playing style how we train uh how we look at the opposition and you know strengths and weaknesses and um exactly how we operate as a team that's what we hopefully we'll get covered today okay so there's gonna be a lot in it but um primarily you know shaped around the team of tactical analysis of the opposition um let's jump into it jay let's let's have a look Okay, so just to start off, like the purpose of this today is really to get grassroots coaches and elite coaches to look at individual development within a team environment. So at, at the under 15s, we're dealing with 13 and 14 year olds. So it's quite important that we help them develop an individual skill set that might help them progress in their career. So we, it's going to be a mixture of uh, a PowerPoint, just use as a reference because I, I I think we're going to just have a chat between the four of us just in terms of each slide, but it's going to be some videos right through the whole presentation. And then we're going to end with a video just in terms of individual development that grassroots coaches can do in smaller areas. So everyone's not lucky enough to have an 11 or so I pitch like we might have an international level. You might have small cages. You might have to train during winter months. You might only have a quarter of a pitch. So what we've done is we've broke down a little video just to look at individual development and small rondos and the key information that we should be given. And then we'll find, um, we will finish it completely then with the CPD assignment. We're going to offer three hour CPD um, and we're going to uh, explain that and outline that by the end of the presentation. So that's okay. right, just to start off, obviously we're looking at it being a tactical analysis of the opposition. So we broke it down into the four quadrants that we're going to cover today for our coaches. So first one is our games program. So we're going to go through with 10 games. So we're going to go through that and a strong emphasis on certain, uh, certain games. Uh, we're going to talk about how we select the players, especially at U15 level, because one of my main priorities in the job is to develop a, a ranking sheet for all our players. So it's, it's sort of on the bottom of that pyramid to have all our players there. And as they progress throughout the age group, obviously that will get smaller and shorter in terms of players, how they progress in terms of their levels. Uh, we're looking at training environment, how we uh, conduct our training sessions, the methods that we use, um, the content and objectives of each session and how we reflect on it. And obviously then the analysis, we have a video near the end of it just in terms of analysis. And we're going to concentrate on the Poland and England games because uh, it's probably the, the best camera angle to see clear pictures uh, in terms of what we're trying to achieve today, Gareth. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, first of all, we move on to the games program. So I'm going to talk about uh, our development tournament, um, which we played in Mayo. It was our first event. Um, so we, we all met up in Castle Bar. We stayed in, in, in the Briefy Hotel in Castle Bar. The lads come in and basically now it's get them used to a high performance environment. So we training match day minus three, two and one. And then we go into our first game against Latvia. So Latvia at the time... We didn't know much about them. Um, we couldn't get any information, obviously, at U15s because it was the first game. But we did know one thing, that they were going to be a very big team because half of the team were going to be a year older. So that was agreed with UEFA that last year can bring a team where they had nine bodies who were going to be of an 04 age group, not an 05 age group. Could that be, um, could that be a little bit daunting for your players? It was. We didn't let them know that, though, to be fair. They, they, didn't, they just thought it was 11 v 11, the same age group. It was only when we were on the pitch, Gary, you would have realised how big they were compared to us. Right. But having said that, we were very organised on the pitch where there was a lot of gaps between them, very, um, between their units in the game. So we, 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 hit the game, we started the game very well. Um, we had numerous chances. The goalkeeper was pulling off save after save. Um, then he got injured and the second goalkeeper came on and then he got man of the match. So that shows you how much we dominated the game. Um, we scored some good goals. Adam Nugent came on, scored a second and tour goal to finish the game off for us. But the focus of the first game for me as a head coach was about the nerves of the players, understanding that they're going to walk out in front of their, their, their family, their friends, supporters in an Irish jersey. Um, what it's going to be like, first of all, to experience the national anthem. Because believe it or not, they're not sure what to do. Some of them put a hand on their chest. Some of them put a hand on their side. Some of them stand facing the, the dugout. Some of them fan, stand facing the flag. So it's so important that we, we sort of get them to understand what's the best practice in terms of the first game they're going to play and how we're going to sort of get them to 
to manage the pressure now where all these people watching. Now, did, so you, we, how we did won- you start that process, Jay? Like, did, did you have a meeting about that? Did you discuss those topics? Yeah, so Gary, what we do is we have a team meeting before uh, each game we play. And within the team meeting then, obviously, we go through our game plan. We select it the first the starting eleven is going to play. Um, we name, obviously, the substitutes and, and also the captain. You know, a great honour, first game, first international game, to be uh, nominated the captain. And then we will outline the process just of um, how you're going to be leaving with the two teams together, working on the pitch. National anthems will be played, you know, show respect to the opposition's national anthem. I don't want you fixing your socks, you know, show, uh, look positive, look strong in the national anthem, face your flag, um, agree, do you put your hands on your side, hands behind the back. So there's little things like this that you need to go through because we cannot forget that kids are not mini adults. They don't understand this. They're 13 or 14 years of age. So we outline that process and then we get onto the pitch and we start playing. So mm-hmm. we dominated the game. We were really happy with a 3-1 win. Unfortunately, we gave away a goal, just a silly error between two centre-backs. Um, but overall, it was a good day. What about the national anthem itself? Um, do you ask players, do they know it? Do you go through it? If they don't know it, what about uh, players that might be born outside the country that didn't grow up learning it in primary school, for example? Mm-hmm. Well, we, we 20, 20, we've kept 23... T- players this year uh, 21 of them were domestic based one of them was in Scotland and one of them was an Irish boy who moved over to Spain um, but they were in on the training camp with us so when they come in for the training camp pre-event we would have gave them a booklet with a national anthem on it and they would be going off to learn the national anthem um, and you know we, we challenged them on that when they come back to us as well to be fair to be honest just to make sure that they have done the work because it's a, it's a huge honour to play for the country and it's so important that they do they do understand the national anthem, they do understand what it means to us. Is, is that part of this? Day, just to highlight that um, some of the players this year did it through phonetics for some of the other players that actually didn't understand it. And that was the first year that they would have done that and actually taught the players how to say the words correctly. Very good. Yeah. And Sean, for, for yourself, like you, like you were born in the UK, learning the national anthem and when you heard it as well, did you have a similar kind of um, process in terms of learning it or being aware of it? Yeah, so something I thought that was going to be very important for me coming into the squad, obviously being born in England, um, I thought it was important that I learned the, the national anthem straight away and just as Will touched on there, that's how I learned it. I had someone write it out for me and then maybe my pronunciations weren't spot on, <laughs> but I thought that I got as close as I could to it. And obviously when the national anthem comes on, it's a sense of real pride. Um, especially when there's 11 men or 11 boys in this case would stand next to you. It's um, quite a special moment. Jerry, does this all come back to, you say, it's, you know, about representing your country? Because ultimately these kids are selected because they're the best of the best, you know, and we, we, we know that they can play football. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's like this is about, you know, I say representing your country. So there's a lot more weight that's kind of carried with it. Yeah, especially on their young shoulders. Yeah. You know, the friends, schoolmates, family, uh, looking for careers in the game. You know, the, Sam Curtis, for example, was the youngest member of the squad. He was 13 years of age. You know, and, and that could be quite daunting. Yeah. Um, so it was up to us as staff, and we did this quite well as staff. We all got on really well, and we all understand that we take all the pressure away, that it is only a game of football, it is to be enjoyed. You know, and we will learn and reflect on each game to make sure that they do progress as a player as you know the games come. Yeah, and that's that's the most important part of how we operate. And going into the Latvia game, had had this squad come together long before? Had you had you many training sessions beforehand? We had a training camp that we had in Johnstown, uh, so we would have brought an extended group of around twenty six players. Um, we would have played two local teams. Well, actually, Sligo came down and that loan, and we played two uh, games. From that game, then, from the game, we would have selected the squad and put the rest of the bodies in standby. But within the training camp, we would have looked at, you know, devising a code of conduct between the players themselves, uh, team goals, but also individual goals throughout the season. Uh, we would have looked at, you know, how to manage their body in terms of prehab and rehab. Um, and also, we would have looked at, in terms of nutrition and hydration, the importance of eating correctly, drinking correctly, because we've three games in a short period of time. 
which they probably wouldn't have been used to before. So it's quite a holistic approach we would look at, especially in the camp leading into the events. Do you find, even though they are young, that they're probably more educated now, the current kind of guys coming through compared to maybe years before? I would do, yeah, especially with the National League. Um, the standards is, is, is improved a small bit in the National League. We also have the National Academy. So they're in for two years before they come towards under the guidance of Niall Harrison and his staff. Um, and they, they, they are, again, it's a holistic approach to what we're trying to achieve with our players. It's not just on the pitch. Um, I, I think I'm on record in one of our earlier interviews um, or reviews of an event saying that this was one of the maturest groups that we probably had in. They took on the information quite well and they built a really good team ethic together um, very, very well. So um, overall, it was a good start to the event against last year. Uh, just, just moving on from that, I think what's really important also for me coming into this setup is the players and how good they are on the tactics board. Obviously, me being a novice, um, I'm trying to move the, the, the markers around and the lads just come up on and move them straight away. So the work that they are doing at the underages is fantastic and the information that they have is superb. Because for me, in my generation, the tactics board was never used. But now I find it's it's a vital tool to aid in, in education, you know? I was going to say, um, Jason, one of the things um, you mentioned there about your t pretty much uh, meeting was uh, selecting the captain. Do you select a different captain for each game? We did. We did. We want to give people plenty of opportunity to go out and show leadership skills on the pitch. They're all captains in different ways. Some people are very... Some people would be that like alpha male in the dressing room, you know, people would class them as the best players. Some would be very quiet, but very focused. Some would be very loud on the pitch. So at the younger age group, it's important that they all get a taste of what it's like to be a leader, to, you know, to, to walk out with a team behind them. Um, we give the captain roles as well. What, you know, during half time, would you like to say that? And then after the game, in terms of the review, would you like to say that? And so it's, it's sort of just putting players outside of their comfort zone a little bit. But it's for their own development in terms of being leaders on the pitch. And it kind of goes on to Sean's point there of them having the courage and the confidence to step up to a tactics board and take that leadership and kind of showcase it. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, you, you, the one key message I would give to all coaches now who are going to watch this would be take away the fear from young players to express themselves. Let Make sure the environment is safe that... They're allowed to have a, a Q&A with the coach in front of players. They're allowed to step up and use the tactic board. They're allowed to have a voice and opinion once it's objectively um, uh, around the session or the game. Take the fear away and let them express themselves. That's one key message I would like to give today. Okay. Um, a good start to Latvia and then you moved on to the next game. Yeah, so the, the, the Faroes was, was a difficult game. Um, we were up in, in, we were playing this game in Westport. The night before, they put on a civil reception for the three Westport boys. The local councillors was in. They got awarded the Medal of Westport. Everything was brilliant. We were going to go down and play in Westport the following morning. And then it just rained nonstop. So the pitch was waterlogged. So it was a late change of venue where we moved to a pitch in Westport. It was a quite a small pitch, so it suited the Faroe Islands really well because... In terms of their, their, anal their analysis of them in the first game, they, they play quite direct and they would sit really a deep block in a 4 5 1. So, on a small pitch, a deep block 4 5 1 is very hard to break down. Um, we, we, again, with we the squad of 20, we made nine changes. So, we always make sure each kid will play one of the games. We will start one of the first two games in any event we play, give them all an opportunity on the pitch. Um, Went in a half time, one nil up after having about ninety percent possession. Loads of sort of half chances, but it was really hard to break down that block. Um, so what I would say to coaches now in terms of analysis, when you're on, you're playing a team with a low block, a four five one, sitting really deep. What we done was we end up making two changes a half time, where we put on a winger and we put on a right, a left wing and a right side centre back. And the right side centre back is better equipped for switching the play for us. So we, instead of trying to play through them all the time, which at times was just too slow, we went from switching play from right side to left and we got in behind then numerous times and we were lucky enough to score a few more goals then. Um, 
So it was a good start with seven goals scored, one conceded. You know, the opposition wasn't the, wasn't the strongest that we were we, we like playing, but this was like UEFA gave us. It was a UEFA development tournament. But we still had to go out and play our way. That was important. We still had to be um, a professional approach. But the main thing was that kids has learned two different oppositions here. Last year, who pressed as a sort of a mid block, but left loads of spaces. We're fair. Faroe Islands now, Faroe Islands were sitting in deep, so we had to come up with a different solution. And that's what we try to do with the kids. Can they come up with different solutions themselves on the pitch? Okay. Well, we move on to the Luxembourg game. So, Will, Will will you take the Luxembourg game for us? Yeah, um, I suppose to, to highlight the Luxembourg game, we went and watched them play against Laffey in the second game. <clears throat> so, Sean would have went and watched with Richie, the goalkeeper coach, the Faroe Islands before we played them. Then myself and the video analysis would have went and watched the Luxembourg game. Uh, they played very, very similar to the way we would try and play. Um, very open, pressed high, played with a 4 2 3 one. What we would have noticed from them was they were very pattern-based. Um, now, they trained like a club team in an academy in Luxembourg, so they're all full-time together, nearly like a club. So you can really see that they went through a lot of patterns of play, how they like to do things. One of the biggest things we would have noticed was they tried to play out through their two centre-backs. Now, the left-sided centre-back was right-footed, and the right-sided centre-back was right-footed also, but he liked to carry the ball into midfield. So when we looked at the analysis, we said, well, right, there's an opportunity where we can go and press them from out to in. So I think there's going to be a clip coming up that hopefully will we'll visualise that for us. But it was something that we really wanted to highlight was that when you're just dealing with players of only 13 and 14 years of age, you have to give them only small little snippets of information that are going to help them in that game. We can't overload them all of a sudden in what is going to look like uh, a huge amount of information. So the less we can give them, the easier it is for them to actually follow out the roles and responsibilities in the game. So in the Luxembourg game, we would have noticed the, the left side of centre back being right footed. So we would have tried to highlight the fact that he was going to come back on the inside but we wanted them to play there so that we could make the play predictable. So here's a little clip of, you know, our staff, we sat down, we, uh, we, we came up with a game plan. So we decided to make sure that our, our wingers were going to press the centre-backs from outside in, as Will uh, alluded to. Just a little clip of where we scored one of the goals from it. And it just, um, it really just summed up our game plan on the day. We went out, we won the game quite well. But uh, they couldn't live around intensity of our press. We got it right from the start. Just a little clip to show. I think it's important to highlight there the Caden, the centre forward, straight away pointing to where we want to go and play to. So we've created a 2v1 on that side and then forcing the left side of the centre back back across. So if you have a look now, look at our defensive shape, how we've all got across into three to five zones and left three furthest players free. So when they try and recycle it, we're obviously shifting back across the pitch, forcing them in. Does the right back come? Good decision to stay. Can the centre back maybe get back across a little bit? But again, the decision on the defensive side to force them to play long and then we win it. And then you have a little bit of individual brilliance here. Can you spin the defender? Very nice and calm possession and great blindside run. Fantastic through ball. And again, you can see the transition to attack moments. We were ready to exploit where they were weak and thankfully scored the first goal of the game from it. Can I just ask Will, just on the when you were doing the analysis of Luxembourg, you mentioned about them being a full time team in the academy setup. Does that does that almost make them predictable um, in a sort of way when you're analysing them? I, I think from our perspective, having been involved with the Emerging Talent Program for the last twelve years since Noel would have already started it, and um, we would have been very similar when we were starting off. We were trying to embed principles and ideas with players. We've now built up that the National Academy and even the National League to an extent now has created a much higher level of playing for the players. So we've embedded those ideas through regional blocks in the centres of excellence. And now it's coming into the National League where they're actually getting to put those football actions into a competitive situation. Whereas what I would have noticed from Luxembourg was they didn't have that opposition to them just yet that they were used to dealing with. So when we pressed them, they were predictable because we made them look predictable the end of the game so so almost kind of like what you're saying there like in the emerging talent program you bring the best of the best together they play against each other but they're not really kind of playing against great opposition in many ways because it's a, it's a more of a development training program but in the national league setup it's much more equal in that there is better opposition because it's spread out across the, the country and different teams 
Yeah, it's coming back on being reality based that you're going into games that are competitive for you. Um, you can go back and say that we, we've had that opportunity all along, that we are going and putting them in the best against the best. There's a massive difference between doing that development team and doing that to try and actually go and win a game of football. So again, it's trying to mirror both and give players the best opportunity because all players learn different ways. Okay. <clears throat> Well, what we're going to do, Gar, we'll move around here uh, quickly into the Poland game. So our next event was Poland. Uh, we played these in Galway uh, in November. So the development one was October. We were looking to get Poland. And Poland gave us another couple of challenges, which Sean is going to go through now. Yes, so we was able to gain some footage of, of Poland. Um, and they played a different system to what we was used to. They played a 1-3-5-2. And again, that was going to be completely different for the players. And I think that obviously in the modern game as well, a lot of the teams are playing 1-4-3-3. So what we did, we was able to find footage of Wolves. So then in the analysis, analysis, we was able to show them footage of how Wolves attack, how Wolves defend. And this was possibly going to be how Poland set up. And I think that in the previous years that we've played Poland, always physically strong. And the size of the country, they have lots of players to pick from. So we knew that this game was going to be a big test. Um, Poland attacking like to play through the thirds, defensively like to press high, and then they would drop back and retreat. So this was going to be obviously a, a much sterner test for the players, but they would have got rid of the nerves coming into these two games. As you can see from the first game, we won 2-1. So then as a staff, we, we had a discussion. And so we thought we'd, we'd challenge the players. In the second game, we decided that we'd go into a low block. I think maybe into the preparation, we had a, a game against England coming up, as you can see, and following that, we were playing Spain and Holland. So as you would imagine, at times in these games, we would be defending deep. So in the previous games where we was able to play that high intensity, press high, I think we were preparing ourselves for against England, Spain, Holland, and the Czech, that at some point they were going to have controlled possession. So then this was really interesting, I thought, in the, in the second game that we got the players to defend in a low block. We came in at half-time, 1-0 down, and the players didn't see themselves in the previous four games, intensity, aggression in the press. And then we spoke as staff, and Jason led it and asked the players, what was, what was the problem? Um, do you enjoy defending in a low block? And instantly there was a reaction, and they were like, no. So Jason asked them, what would you like to do then? And every one of them looked excited and they said, we'll press high, we want to press high. We came out into the, into the second half and we ended up getting two goals and winning the game 2-1. So I think from that moment as a staff, it was a really important, significant moment because when you come together and put a game plan, it's not just the staff, but it's the players because when the players cross the white line, they have, they have to implement the plan. And what it showed was that the players were uncomfortable defending in a low block. And so from that moment on, we knew that for this group of players, the characteristics were they wanted to press high. And yes, there's going to be occasions where you need to defend deep. But initially, we was going to go and press high, whether it was England, Spain, Holland. And as we go through uh, the video, you will be able to see that. It's, it's really interesting there, Sean, because the, the change of formation, as you highlight, is, is important, isn't it, at this age level? Because it means that they're not just, um, you know, being systematic or anything like that. Like, you know, that it's being used to one formation and being used to playing against the same types of teams. That It's a completely different challenge when someone sets up differently like that. Yeah, it is. A, like I say, it's a fantastic challenge. So, also, what we do, we showed the footage of Poland. We asked them the question, what are the strengths of Poland? What are the weaknesses of Poland when we're attacking? Where are Poland going to be vulnerable? Who are going to be the three players? The answers are almost spot on, and it goes back to the tactics board, the work that is happening at the underages. You know, they know the answers, and it was on the sides. So more, than, more times than not, our fullbacks would be the three players because the wing-back has the decision to make. Does he go and press high, or does he stay as a defending five? So... It was a really good chance and a change, I think, for the players to adapt. And they did really well in this instance. Great, great. 
think I think if you come in there, just a part of it would have been as well. We were worried that we were training three days, we played a game, then we trained another day. We were saying, listen, would they have the energy to be able to press high? You know, in a type of way. So we were trying to say, listen, manage the game or control the game. When we talk about, you know, how, how our playing style is, we would like to control the game. So we were sort of saying to them, you know, have we got the energy to do it? But they were, uh, they were fantastic. We dominated that second half so well that Poland couldn't liberate us. Can I, can I counter that a little bit and kind of play devil's advocate and say, you know, our kids at that age are always going to say that, let's press high, let's kind of go attack like? No, not my experience, because it, 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 we would ask these questions numerous times. Like, for example, we would have asked the, the question against uh, Holland when we played Holland, and they said, no, I think we should drop off and let them have the ball up there because of Holland's rotations. Okay. So I think it's, it's, it's more about educating them in terms of system versus system strengths versus weaknesses like what we do in the coach education system um and then from there we we, we devised a game plan between us all how important is it what sean says there where you ask that question to the players um and and kind of empower them to kind of you know have a voice uh well i think it's vitally important especially at the younger age um because as they get older all the other managers we all work together as a as international managers and staff so from Stephen right down to me to all the age groups we all discuss we all chat about a syllabus how we add layer information on top of each age group when does winning become more important than development or does it become more important than development in underage um so so important then that we get players um, being able to be comfortable to ask questions, being able to have an opinion. But coaches, your staff are so important. So I'm lucky enough I've great staff. I've, I'm lucky enough I finished my education pathway. Uh, Will would be a specialist in elite youth development, so the age group suits. Sean has just gone on to his A licence now, so we've seen it from his, his professional background, academy background, offering to the players now. A goalkeeping coach has gone on and he's done his uh, goalkeeping A licence as well which is only one of four or five coaches in the country. So all the staff are all experts, I would say, of dealing with the age group because the personality and, as you said, the characteristics are different at a younger age. They're not many adults. So we've got to make sure they understand that they're allowed to have a dialogue with staff in the dressing room rather than just a monologue of us telling all the time what to do. Well, can I ask a little bit about the attitude of these types of players like that? On, on paper, when... when but maybe when we see Ireland going over to England playing and in their home training base in St. George's Park, like that might be daunting for us. Is it different for these kids like that they're much more confident in their own ability and they don't see it as a daunting thing? Or is that something that you have to work with if, if they do feel a bit overawed by it? Well, I think that's a, a vital point is that we do do quite a lot of work on the mindsets of the players. Um, again, Jason's talking about empowering them. I don't think he's given enough responsibility to what he passes on to us as coaches to then deal with the players when we were growing up as Sean alluded to tactic sports were out the window kids nowadays play FIFA the whole time their knowledge base is unbelievable I think if you actually ask the child now when they're playing a game like that they spend more time sorting out their tactics than they do actually playing the game now and the knowledge that they come in with into our setup we have to use we have to show them that, look, it's, it's, your, it's your game. You cross that white line, as I said. It's up to you to deliver. We're just there to help them and give them little snippets to make them even better. So that when they progress on to Paul for the 16s, they're even better players again. When they go back to their National League clubs, they're able to play at a much higher level, which is going to develop the, the league nationally as well. Jason, I was clearly born in the wrong era because when I voiced my opinion as a kid, I was told to shut up and say, you're the mouthy one, like, you know, but clearly it's different now. Yeah, no, you, you, you've got to have that safe environment where they're allowed voice and opinion. You know, it all has to be obviously uh, contributing to environment of what we're trying to do, like, if that makes sense. But um, no, it's, it, it's a dialogue. And that's the way we work as staff. Right from, right from our doctor, we have 11 staff members. Even from Adam, we would have done some media training with the boys at 14 years of age yeah. through the communications department, which you run. So it's so important that, you know, the, the kids are just getting uh, getting equipped for situations that might happen as they get older. I so. Yeah. Um, we, then after that, we were lucky enough, England asked us we'd come over to play a one-off game in December. Um, 
we, we brought over the squad into England. Uh, we played in George's Park. It was on the first team pitch. First time I noticed the players being very, very nervous, Garrick. Um, it, 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 it even came when I walked out to the warm-up. I had to, not I had to, but I pulled the two coaches aside and said, lads, these are really nervous. You've got to try to relax them a little bit. Mm. I've never seen them so nervous, you know. It's, it can be quite daunting, George's Park. It's fantastic facility, dressing rooms. Um, we set up the team going out. We, we, we made a weekend of it. So, you know, where we played England on the Sunday, we had a squad of 18. So it's very hard to get 18 players involved in one game without disrupting the flow of the game. So Sean was lucky enough to organise a game against Leicester City's under-16 academy on the Saturday. So we, uh, we, we used that as like an extended training session. Um, even though the game was a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. <clears throat> but we could manage the minutes, the training roles, just to make sure we were all fresh in terms of the performance against England the following day. Um, we had a great result against England. We, were, we won 3-1. We were 2-0 uh, up. Um, they got it back to 2-1 and we scored a tour goal. We finished quite strongly. But what was best about it was our performance. Um, Result aside, I'm, I'm working in the FEI since 2006. And for me, being involved with the 19s all the way down at different levels, to me, it was the best performance I've seen in terms of dominating possession, creating opportunities. It was one of those days where your whole 11 players turned up and played to the highest level. And we, we couldn't have been happier at half time. Um, Will, Will was first one in the dressing room at half time. And he came out to us. You want to tell a story about half time, Will, and the tactic board, what you were saying? Yeah, well, I think it was interesting that day because Richie wasn't there and I took the goalkeepers. So as a goalkeeper coach, I think you spend more time individually dealing with players. So I would have done the goalkeeper B license back in the day as well through the coach education pathway. And at half time, I walked into the dressing room and literally the players were already in there discussing on a tactics board what they can do better, how they can improve for the second half. So when I came back out to the lads, I said, look, we literally don't have much to do here. So went in and we just sort of watched. I don't think we said much in that half-time team talk at all because the players did nearly the whole lot of themselves because they were fixing, they were coming up with solutions to any problem that they'd encountered in the first half. And it wasn't just the 11 that were on the pitch. The substitutes were involved. They were like us on the sideline, picking up all those little bits of information to tell the lads at halftime. And even when they went onto the pitch, that they were fully able to replicate what had happened in the first half and be able to correct any issues that might have occurred. And that's what Jason's talking about, empowering those players that they can go and do that. They take responsibility for their own actions when they go onto the pitch because ultimately we can't do much once that whistle goes and they're on the pitch on their own. That's so encouraging to hear that. Like, and it's... It's you can just picture in your mind of all the kids, you know, uh, gathered around the tactics board. Can I, without trying to be pessimistic at all, can I, can I can I ask the question of can that go too far? Like if you come in and you maybe disagree with the kids about an approach or question it, it might feel that you're forcing their bubble of positivity almost. No, no, yeah, yeah, you're right. No, no, no. We obviously we have to facilitate, look in, and make sure what they're talking about is the right detail. We give them the ownership, but, you know, we might have to give them some direction at times as well, just in terms of what they're talking about in the process of how they're doing things. Um, so you're right, it can go too far. You can't just let them all on their own. It has to be facilitated. Um, and that's the most important part. So one of, us, one of the coaches then would be looking maybe from, from the outset over their shoulders, um, just making sure the information is right. Then when it stops, they'll sit down and we will still summarise. Okay just for the coaches watching you have a 15 minute half time from our point of view we always leave for about 4 or 5 minutes before we even talk then we only talk for 4 or 5 minutes and then we let the players get set but what's most important is before they leave you, you should summarise your key points of what you're getting across because we for, in one of the games I use an example where we talked for about 10 minutes and then the first thing I said, I asked the players, what was the first thing I said when I started that chat? And none of the players could remember. Mm. So, so important that how you deliver the information and that you summarize your information before you do go on the pitch. They need to understand the personal improvement goals before they go on the pitch. They need to have it clear in their head 
what to uh, implement when they go on the pitch as well. So just another, another little uh, nugget of information I picked up off coaches. Make sure you always summarise what you, you've been discussing just before they go onto the pitch. Can I ask, um, just with regards to that, the half-time period then as well, um, it's been common practice for many years that the substitutes will probably go out back onto the pitch you know, while the team is in the dressing room getting the information or they're on the sideline, whatever it may be, and the substitutes go off on their own and they're warming up. Is that something you would advise against, like in terms of all the groups should be together to hear collectively what's being said before they go off to warm up? Go on, Sean, you take that one. Yeah, I think that it's critical that the um, players, who, oh, sorry, the subs who are in there listen to the information that's been given because... Once the second half starts, a player could get injured within the first two minutes. And so if that player does not have the information, he's been outside um, playing a rondo, then mm. he's not going to be able to fulfil his role out onto the pitch. So as Jason touched on then, the, the key points only take four minutes. So he can listen to the information, then go out and warm up. Um, and then once if he's needed to come on, then he's ready to go and fulfil his role out onto the pitch. I think it's critical that they take on information. And even if they don't come onto the pitch instantly, they still have that information. And at this age, you know, development, education is key. Again, I think just to highlight what Jason said as well there, like the substitutes have to be ready to go on. So even at the end of that couple of minutes, Jason always said to him, if you have any questions, come and ask the coaches. But during our first couple of minutes talking, Jason will have already told us Sean, I want you to say this to X player before they go back out. But if we're planning ahead and Jason already has the minutes, what they have planned to play, if you're going to talk to the right winger and he's going to come off in 15 minutes, the right winger that's going on from needs to understand what you're going to say to that player at half time to try and help them in the second half. Mm -hmm. So it's a case that we will have little tasks then at half time as coaches that Jason specifically said, right, well, goalkeeper coach, talk to your goalkeeper. It might be Sean, talk to a centre half or myself, talk to a centre forward that they all understand when they go back out what their little small task is to go with the team and the unit. Can I ask about that, just the transfer of information there? Obviously, you, you mentioned there you have a small window, like you leave them alone to settle down, maybe their adrenaline comes down as well, you know, they can recover and rehydrate and stuff like that. Then you get the points across and you, and you make it into kind of bite-sized digestible chunks. Is, is that the same sort of uh, transfer of information when you're making substitutes as well? Like I often see, you know, and I, particularly when you're watching high level, whether it's the English Premier League or Bundesliga or whatever, a substitute coming off the bench and the goalkeeper coach says something to him, the assistant coach says something to him, the manager says something to him. And by the time he gets to the sidelines going on, he's had so many different people speak to him. I kind of just wonder, is his mind all cluttered at this stage? Like, is that, is that something that we have to kind of strip back a little bit kind of, and kind of say one person talks to him or... Or, or is there a method to the madness there of all the people giving them different points? Well, we're a principle-based team. So basically, we've KPIs for each position and, and how, to, uh, how to perform on the pitch in terms of our game plan. So we're principle-based. So the idea of that is we might play one four three three. It might be flexible and versatile, where it might be one four two three one. It might be four five one. It might be four one four one. But the principles are still the same. We, you know, that type of way. So each position that comes into us, we would outline their role, their KPIs, which we'll go through shortly. Um, so they understand that whatever position they play, this is what's expected of them. So we would train that. Every training session we do would be individual based in terms of the positions in a team environment. So it's so important then that our training sessions would help them develop as a position rather than just develop as a team. Okay. So we're play, we played Australia, they were U17s, physically huge, strong. Uh, the first half for me was fantastic. It was a proper football game. Um, their intensity, their press, their aggression, air lads really got shook up for the first time. Um, we regrouped the half time, we changed a couple of things around, we scored two goals in the second half to win. For a half time, it was really a proper football game. It wasn't like a development game. It was like they were playing a U17 team. They were out there. They were nearly men. The size was bigger, the aggression. Everything was really good for these guys to experience, which was great leading up into the Spain and the Holland games. Um, 
we played quite well in the game. They pressed us quite high uh, in a 4-4-2. But what caught us out was sometimes when they were building up, their right back would push all the way up, right up and like be a winger, and the winger would play on the inside. So they played sort of like lopsided on the right-hand side. And that sort of, that sort of caused those issues because we always play three or five lanes when we're defending, which I'll allude to later on. Um, so Kevin Zeffi, who was a winger at the time, was getting caught in too much. And they were creating a 2v1 overload on the far side. So that would, they, they were issues now for the players to solve themselves, which they've done tremendously, especially in the second half. Um, but for me, the aggression of the way Australia played was fantastic for the kids because the kids came off and they were shattered because the intensity of the game was the first... Well, the intensity of the game was the, the most intense they've ever had. So that was huge learning for them as well. And then it was learning to control the game. We're two and up with 10 minutes to go. They're pressing us, control the game, control the pace of the game so we can stay in the game longer. That was our, our, our main learning from the opposition of, uh, of Australia, I have to say. Was it, would there have been a danger at all in terms of physicality going in against a, a group of players that are uh, older and, and bigger and more powerful? I mean, it could happen in any game, you know, tackles or lays. I, I don't think there's a, a danger. Um, Australia were due to play Paulo, Paulo Zams on their 16s team, but they, uh, they were away in a tournament in Turkey, which came in late for them. So we took the game. Uh, we got through an injury free. It was fine. Um, but it was, it, it was good for the players to experience it, though, because um, the intensity of the game for, from the first minute to the 80 minute was really strong. Like, um, and they were tired after, I have to say, really tired after. Okay. Um, we'll move on to Spain we went to a tournament then, development tournament in Spain which ended up being our last tournament which was uh, unfortunate uh, obviously with the, uh, the coronavirus um, I would have loving to have one more event after this because in these three games we didn't win one of the games which is, it's, it's, that's not a huge importance but I wanted to see the reaction of the team, of the players then in a different event because it's the first time they lost a game so I would have liked to have another event in to see their reaction, see their learnings from this tournament. Um, we played uh, Spain. They tried to dominate us in terms of possession and obviously the press was very high in, a, in like a, a one four four two. 4 um, But it was interesting because in the first 20, 25 minutes, we were in total control. Not control of the ball, but control of the game. Our game plan was working to a three. We, we pressed them high. When, if anything, we needed to drop off about 10 or 15 more yards. And what was interesting about the Spain game is the staff, the coaches here, we couldn't agree on the selection of the first 11. So this was probably the first time where we all had different opinions about who should start the game. We all understood the game plan because we know this team wanted to press. But it was having the right personnel in the right positions in this game to carry out the game plan. And we couldn't agree. So... I mean, I went, obviously, as the head coach, I went where I felt was right. Uh, the, the lads back us up, as we always do. But we probably needed to make one change quite early in the game, which we did in the second half, which made a difference, I suppose. Why, why uh, do you think we, that you had the different opinions? Is it, is it because of maybe you wanted different things out of this particular game? Yeah, well, it was probably against Australia. We started with a centre-forward and a different and a winger. Different than we did against England. In, in against England, some of the staff would wanted how we played against England. Some of the staff would have wanted how we played against Australia because both performances are really good. Mm. So it was different personnel. So I just decided we'll go with what we've done against Australia because I thought the boys done really again against the high uh, aggression press of the of the under seventeen team. Um, but ultimately, I think if we went against England, because the centre forward we played against England is a good communicator. He understands his role a little bit better. Uh, he thinks about when he presses or when he delays. Where against uh, Spain, Australia, we played with Alex. And Alex won't mind me saying this, because we would always give them feedback in a one-to-one -one format. That he's got to really make the decision of if, if, if he can't keep the opposition's head down, he can't press. He needs to stay off and wait till they come to us a little bit. So Gaps was appearing against Spain, which, uh, which ultimately they scored two of the goals in. Will, what would have been the reaction then to, to losing? How, how, how did the players react to losing against Spain? Well, I think it was a, an eye-opener for some of the players. A lot of them wouldn't have been 
used to losing games. But again, we were trying to highlight going into the game that these are going to be the most competitive and the toughest games that you're going to have played in. So it's as much reality-based learning for the players in that as it is for us as coaches in the coach education pathway that they need to be put into these environments where they understand how tough it's going to be to play at the top, top level. Not just nationally in Ireland in the National League, but internationally in football against the best players in the world. Um, I think Jason is going to highlight the, the Dutch centre forward in a few minutes and his training um, loads in comparison to a lot of our players is, is humongous. But he was trying to bridge that gap and get as close countries as possible, which I think we have the opportunity in this country and we're going about it the right way through the player development plan. It is, it is often the toughest part of a coach to react to a, a defeat, to lift the players. Obviously, you, you've got to prepare for the next game, don't you? You have a short window um, will to kind of prepare for that. So it's it's going back to what you were saying earlier about you know, working on the mindset of the players as much as anything during that period of time. Absolutely, and it's about helping to overcome that. Um, now, we went through in the, the player learning journal that every player will get about setting goals for themselves during the week. But then you have to reassess those goals if they were going into the games and they were only focused on winning because winning is a process that you can't control. But it's something that a lot of young players will put in, that it's, it's winning-based. But again, we've got to set the procedures based on our principles as to how you actually get to the solution, which is to ultimately win a game of football. That's the aim of the game at the end of it. But we have to develop those players so that they understand how they get to that end goal and don't just couple the procedures in between, which is why the principles in the game plan become so important to them. Jason moved on to the game against Holland. Yes, yeah, so Sean's going to discuss Holland here and then um, Will will have a, a short discussion on the Czech Republic game and then just a little video just to outline one or two, uh, one or two scenarios that we had to deal with in this, in this, uh, in this uh, tournament. Yeah, so we entered um, into the Holland game off the back of obviously the Spain one where we lost. Um, Holland had won the first game 4-0 against Czech Republic. So obviously I was there watching the game, the player won 4-3-3 and they had loads of different um, rotations, lots of pace, power, but also great technical ability that come with that. So we knew it was going to be a very tough game and there was only, I think, one day's break between and for our players who probably don't train as often as what the Dutch players do. Um, we thought it would probably be the best if we conserved a little bit of energy and maybe go into a bit of a um, bit of a mid block where we defended a little bit deeper. The line of engagement wasn't as high. Um, and as the tournament ended up, Holland were obviously the outstanding team in the tournament. They um, pressed really aggressively and I thought that they had great cohesion within the team and I think that was probably down to was there seven to nine players that came from Ajax I believe um, so I think when you have so many players that come from one club in the full-time program that they're in it's easy for that cohesion to show when they're all playing in, in the same national team side um, so obviously went into that game unfortunately lost and we'll show some clips after but then we was obviously moving into the Czech Republic game. Well, yeah, the Republic game. Then, um, see, in between, I would have went to watch Republic playing and get an understanding of how they play. But again, they would play quite similar to us. We would have played them over the last number of years as well. They play a four-three-three. They like to build up through the thirds. They defend with sort of a mid to high block. But again, they will be quite a physical team. Um, they'll be quite a well-built nation. They also come from full-time academies, so the players themselves probably weren't as fatigued as some of our players have been. So we would have been through, again, not being disrespectful to uh, England in any way, shape or form, but between Holland and Spain, the two games that we played over in Pinatar were absolutely unbelievable games. The intensity and... Um, managing the players' minutes and their training loads going into that game to try and get a third game, as you mentioned there a second ago, trying to build back up their self-belief and confidence after losing their first two ever international games was massive. Um, and again, during that game, which we highlight, the lads equipped themselves incredibly well. But I think the two goals we did conceive were probably purely down fatigue. There's just not having the, the football fitness to be able to carry out and execute 
what we would have hoped to be able to do during the game. Okay. So what we're going to do, Gar, just to summarise this, obviously there was three games and under time restraints as well. So we felt the Holland game, Sean's going to talk through the Holland game here, and we put a couple of clips together just to show you what we were dealing with tactically. And I think as staff, after this, we sort of agreed that if we were going to do this again, we would play probably a one four four two against it, where our 10 would join a 9. So we get a little bit of a higher press in terms of the rotation of, uh, of, 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 of the Dutch. Plus also then where our wingers be able to deal with the wide, the width from uh, the Dutch fullbacks here, as you can see. But Sean's going to go through it now um, and hopefully show us one or two clear pictures. Go well, as you can see here, both teams, um, the Dutch are in a 1-4-2-3-1 with the defensive midfielder just splitting into that kind of false fullback position. You have the fullback, right fullback there, really wide. And then you have the left fullback who's creating the width on this left-hand side here. You can see Caden, the striker, forcing... Nice compact shape, three of the five lanes, and he's able to force the error. Force the error. As the Dutch moving out with the ball, again, similar scenario, similar setup. Defensive midfielder into the false fullback, whip created by the fullback, wide forward inverted. Unfortunately, Caden can't get across. Now a midfielder needs to engage. There's no pressure on the ball, which allows him to switch the play out to the right fullback, who's really high. Good defending there from our left back. Here we are, nice and calm under pressure, but you can see the numbers that the Dutch have. Really aggressive press. Good composure showed by Daniel, but look, for six numbers. If you can get that pass through there, then we're advancing and attacking. But as they've increased their numbers, you can see there, three versus two. This is just really good play, free kick. Quick thinking, make eye contact. The Dutch with a high line, can you play through? That's just something in a, maybe in, in a cage, if you're playing a rondo, hand on and play. Or in a small-sided hand on play. And a really calm and composed finish by the striker. But I think you can just see just from that clip how expansive the Dutch were. Um, and in any level of football, you know, you need to apply pressure on the football, otherwise they will continually switch the play. The yeah, quick reaction there, Sean, is, is really uh, positive, isn't it? Of uh, just taking the free quick, uh, free kick quite quickly. Yeah, and I think that's something that we would do in training, whether it be in a rondo or in a small-sided game. If the ball goes out of play, hand on, play quickly. And I think with that instance, with the, the goal, it's making contact with the player, but it's intelligence of the two players where they're able to see that, you know, the space is in behind. So can you penetrate through that space? And then obviously Caden, um, so it's a fantastic finish. He takes his touch in front of the defender, which makes it impossible for the defender to make a tackle. And he's, and he's able to score. Sean, can I just ask about the, um, the the defender trying to play out and the pass being intercepted by the Dutch there? Is, 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 a lot of coaches might look at that and kind of say, when you're in that position, just clear it, like, you know, just get it out of play. But would you almost be encouraging the player to kind of play out from the back and kind of stick to the principles of play, even though it was intercepted? Yeah, I think so. Because at this age, players are allowed to mistakes. We try and create a, a, an environment where it's all about the development. And at this age, they are going to make mistakes. But in another instance, if he is able to break that line, release out of pressure, I think he was able to see the numbers that we had. I think it would have been a, a six versus four. Um, and the Dutch were very aggressive. It's risk versus uh, reward in this case. And they were able to win it. And then I think they had a three v two. But, you know, we want to encourage our players to play because he, the pass was on. He just wasn't, wasn't able to execute it. Um, and then if he finds himself in that situation again, then he may be able to do that. Um, but, you know, we're always encouraging the correct processes. Very good. Hey, so, Gar, just quickly, we'll just move on. Um, I'm just going to fly through the selection processes. It's so important for people to understand, especially uh, the grassroots coaches. Um, what we try to do, we, we, we get some player ID reports come into us from, obviously, from the National League, Centre of Excellence, Schoolboy Leagues and Kenny Cups. 
So um, then we, as staff, we will go out and watch as many games as we possibly can, especially in the National League, because the, the standard of playing the National League seems to be much better now than, it, than it's ever been. The players are challenged more, and the gap is a little bit closer than there is to international levels that we play. Um, we select an extended squad based on all the idea reports we'd get in June in the National League, and then we could bring them in for what's called assessment days. Um, we would reduce that now from big numbers. So we might have 50 bodies in who've done quite well on, on player identification uh, in, in the player identification process. And we might reduce that then to a, a camp where we bring in the top 26 and then we reduce that to the first squad of 20. But what, what, what's key for me is this. These kids are 13 and 14. They're going through uh, development uh, in terms physically, obviously, even, even psychologically. Um, they're starting to grow up a wee bit, going through puberty. So it's so important now that after each event, where we might only select 18 to 20 for one event, we will bring the bigger numbers back in again. We stay, they will be playing more, training more, they'll be fitter. They could have even hit a growth spurt, got more powerful. Because it is important you meet the demands of the game. Now, we're not saying it has to be tall players or strongest players, but they do have to meet, be physically able to meet the demands of the game. So that, you know, the actions in an international game, you've got to maintain good actions, but maintain many actions throughout the whole 80 minutes. So you have to have enough power and the fitness capacity to be able to do that. So we, it's, it's so important that we monitor them after each event. So the bigger numbers come in after each event, each event, everyone then gets an opportunity to impress again. And for example, just before our last tournament, we brought Alex Malone, who's a fullback from Shamrock Rovers. Alex came into the assessment day he done better than the right back that would have been there previously. So we would have went with Alex for this time because of, we felt that he deserves that opportunity. So it's a revolving door for all the players, especially at the younger age. It's that um, important for them to get used to that because rejection is going to be part of professional football, isn't it? And, and the higher they go up, they're going to have to get used to setbacks. Yeah, well, the, I, w I, wouldn't, I don't like the word rejection, but I, I, I like to build their resilience in terms of the knockbacks. Okay. And what, you know... I think they need to realise, you know, they're going to have to come up against a lot of highs and lows if they're going to be a footballer, whether it's fitness, whether it's selection, whether it's starting, whether it's being a sub, whether it's uh, injuries. So it's important that you have a positive mindset how to react with that. But in the selection process, it's important for us that we get plenty of contact time. And Rude, to be fair to him, has invested a lot of money with the 15s age group. Because when I took over in 2016, we had six to seven games. Last year, uh, we were due to play another tournament in Italy where the game was 15 games. Mm. You know, unfortunately, that fell by the wayside with the coronavirus, but they would have had 15 games. And that's a huge investment into our youth football. I'm playing against you know? top-class opposition as well. And, and Rude would always say that. He'll never judge me on the results as a head coach. I wouldn't be judging results. I'd be more uh, judging the process. Mm. So... Um, so it's good that we're in these meetings together with Rude and the international managers and we all can have this debate so we're all on the same wavelength, you know? It's very important going forward. Um, so from there, listen, I'm going to quickly move on to, you know, these are the indicators that we would, uh, these are the indicators that we would try to look at. So obviously, uh, we're looking at in terms of the player, how he communicates on the pitch with his team, but also how he communicates with the opposition. I have a few clips about that later on. Um, his decision making process so it's important that every session we do has opposition in and this is why it's, uh, reality based learning for me is the best process He's, the, the players are always communicating in terms of what decision to make and then he has to execute that decision so for example in the last clip against Holland Daniel the centre back he got pressed he took a touch inside then he got his head up and he realised that he was getting pressed by four or five numbers. So the decision he made then was try to play a pass to the fullback. Arguably then, that pass possibly should have been a longer pass. So he needed to execute maybe a longer pass. Mm. So we would judge them then who makes the best decisions at the right moment in terms of the game. Some of the indicators, standout skill, you know, in the impact you have in the game, character in and around the dressing room, hotel. Um, when I'm, what, what we mean by pressure here, we would mean that, you know, there is a pressure environment. Can they handle that environment by staying calm? But also, can they handle the, the Q&A, the, um, the challenges we might empower them with? And also, on the pitch as well, can they receive the ball under pressure? Stay calm and make the right decision. And obviously, potential as well. 
Um, there's no, as I said beforehand, there's no crystal ball. What actually is potential? Um, all I can say about this is, if, if they're in our system, we're going to be they're in our system for six or seven years, so we can monitor and see are they going to sort of develop their potential that we see they have. Um, we we then what we develop KPIs. So Will might come in here now. Will? Yeah, well we we based this around sort of player profile. So as you can see in the player here, we we selected Evan Ferguson as a centre forward. And um, going through it, as you can see, the amount of detail is there on the four functions of the game with attack and transition to defend, defending with transition to attack. So the four functions are covered for the players. So anyone involved in coach education will notice all that. We then have to break that down for the players so that they're getting their individual player development within that team environment. So the centre forward will have a specific set role that they need to understand. A lot of this work comes prior to us, um, whether it's with their national league clubs, back down the grassroots clubs. As Sean mentioned, the, the no fear attitude of getting to play with freedom without fear of mistakes earlier on through the player development plan. You then break it down and this is just one of the six facets of the player profile for the centre forward where they have the actions and responsibilities for themselves based on just build up in their own half. So you can see on the side there, there's a lot of information there. We can't overload the players with six times that amount of information on just build up play in your own half and taking it on with the key performance indicators then as well. So again, you're looking at the centre forward. What do you expect from them during the game? And then can they actually deliver it? So again, you'll see on the key performance in gears, do they have the football fitness levels? Are they good accelerators? Now, the centre forward is completely different to what a centre midfielder's KPI might be. And again, their responsibilities are going to be completely different also. But a lot of what's similar is the communication of football actions on and off the ball, in and out of position, in and out of possession, decision making of your football actions on and off the ball, and obviously as well, the execution of it. And that's what really sets aside the, the top class players at those age groups. As Jason alluded to, Evan Ferguson is what will be a quarter four baby, which means he's kept in the system even though he might be physically quite tall. It took a while to grow into his body, but we've got to take in all those characteristics of players into consideration at such a young age and continuously give them the opportunity to be in the system and not feel that they're being left out of it. Yeah, so... It's, it's vital. So what we try to do is when the players come in, we might have six centre forwards. So we try to look at it as objectively as possible. All the staff would be all well in tune, exactly our selection process and what we're trying to find with our players. And then what we form is a ranking sheet. Who we feel is number one at the moment, two, three, four. But that ranking sheet changes. So a player who might be number one, for example, in July or June, June July, doesn't mean they're going to be number one again the season finishes in April and May. You know, and then what happens is we have a, a database of all the information, the strengths, the weaknesses of each player, um, the, the performances in their games, a review, self-reflection of each player. And then all that then is submitted to Paul Azam, the U16 manager, and he would take it from there. So it, it, that's the process we follow right to all the age groups. Very good. Okay. So listen, the training environment, which Sean might talk about our playing philosophy a little bit now. Yeah, so obviously the playing, the philosophy, you know, we set up to win each game rather than not lose. I think we believe that, you know, we have to create a winning mentality. For me, winning is a habit. And I think you, when you're 13 or 14, you naturally want to win. It's human nature. And I think that goes through when you play senior football. But then it obviously becomes a significance on senior football. But still, even at this age, I think it's really important that we do create that winning mentality. Um, Can we just come in on that for a second? Because it, it is an important point, really, isn't it? Because you do see a grassroots football all over the world where the don't lose the game rather than go to win the game, where they might say, press them in the corner, keep them high up the pitch, you know, kick the ball out of play as much as you can, time wasting, whatever it might be. So altering that mentality from early age is very important. Yes, it is really important. I think that this is what we're trying to, to build and, and help create is leaders. Um, and by doing that, you know, I think you, you gain a real togetherness um, by winning each game because there's no better feeling than going into a changing room um, after a game when you've won. And 
that's how you build that togetherness and that team spirit. Um, and as I say, you know, when I've been in successful teams as a, a senior footballer, there's no better feeling. Um, and then when you come back into work the next day, into training, the atmosphere is, is so much better. Um, so like, yeah, you know, I think it's important that this is, is, is related to the players. Okay. Yeah, so then we'll move on into dominate possession and press with pace and aggressiveness. You know, what we're trying to do here now is to try and control the football, even when we play against Spain, um, England, Holland, and as you'll see in the clips against England that we'll move on to shortly, you know, we're controlling the football, we're moving the, the midfield line, we're moving the first line of defence from England. And, you know, that's something that has been slowly happening in the underages um, in Ireland. And then now you hear of the, the first team manager, Stephen Kenny, talking about we want to control the football, we want to dominate, we want to press high. And that's something that Jason and the underages have been slowly building. And now the momentum is obviously in with the first team and we're all, all almost singing from the same hymn sheet and we have the same message that's going through the FAI. And, you know, we're creating an identity, which I think is, is really important. Um, when the players come in, I think it's been highlighted already in the slides that, you know, we try to give them the confidence they can make, no, they can make mistakes, 13 or 14. Go out there, play with no fear. If you make a mistake and it leads to a goal, but you've attempted the right pass, you've just, the execution isn't correct. Well, then, so be it. You know, the next time you do it, can you improve, um, get feedback um, and ask the questions? And that's the only way the players will improve. Intensity, I think, is a big one in the modern game. Um, I think you see the athleticism of the players. And I think especially this year, we had that, especially in our front players. We, we had the players who were able to repeat high-intensity actions, you know, who could do it and be successful. Um, and that was a really important part of our game this year, especially against the, the likes of Spain, Holland. And it's, again, what the manager of the first team wants. He wants to go and press and not be into a low block and almost letting the other team dominate. Um, managing game scenarios we try to give enough information to the players when they cross that white line but sometimes there's things that happen in game that we that we don't plan for when we play in Holland they went down to 10 men in the second half they changed formation but because we'd obviously been in at half time um, it was almost difficult to relay that information onto the players so now that they have to find their own scenarios and solutions and then that's where the 11 voices on the pitch come into it. You know, you have to talk, you have to communicate, okay? The, um, the striker, he's playing as a secondary striker in between the lines now, okay? So does that mean that the defensive midfielder might then have to come and mark the player rather than the centre-back communication? Um, players accountable and responsible. For me, this is a huge point. You know, what we're trying to obviously help is the decision-making process for the players, you know, problem solvers, as I just touched on. When there's a problem on the pitch, the, the team is doing something that we might not necessarily have planned for in the, in the team meeting. Can you solve that problem? Okay. If you don't know the answer, you know, ask your teammate next to you. If he doesn't know the answer, then you might get past the message to ask the manager, you know, if no one has a solution. And then again, the last one, individual and team development. Um, I think we all think that individual development is, is key. And by that, the byproduct is that the team does well. So I think if we focus on individual actions, helping the player, then the team will be successful because of that. Okay. Really yeah, sure. interesting to see that the, the, the philosophy you said there, but it's also, Jason, as, you, as Sean said there, and you've kind of already mentioned it's connected to what's being done at uh, the age grades above 16, 17s, 18s, 19s, 21s, and, and now the senior level as well. Yeah, it, it can only be good for players going forward. Um, the managers are all in, all the staff, not just managers, all the staff are in tune with each other. Everyone understands how we operate. Our operation principles would be like that. 
when they come in with us, we try to instill a high performance culture. We, even though we're looking at that individual development of the player and a player centered approach, we still have to build a, a togetherness within that team. You know, especially when you go away for tournaments, you're away for tournaments, you could be away for two weeks. You know, it's, you, you've got to make sure everyone's getting on quite well. Yeah. Um, resilience, we talked about resilience a wee bit earlier on, Gar. We, we're saying it's, you know, there's going to be so many knockbacks in your career, you know. It's our job to try to offer advice. Now, I haven't played a game professionally. That's fine. I understand that. But Will has played a game professionally in the National League and Sean has played a game professionally in England and internationally. So between the three of us, and then Richie having the experience of uh, playing the National League as a goalkeeper as well, and the goalkeeper in a license, which he experienced around Europe, you bring all the staff together. We'll all have something to offer when we come to these four quadrants. You know, so the same questions might come to me about I'm going, a player might be going on trial to the UK. You know, is there any advice? And I said, hold on, when we get Sean. And then we sit down with Sean and talk about the academy structure in the UK and what's expected of them, how it's going to work. Yeah. So all together, the staff really work hand in hand together. And that is what I mean here in terms of uh, these operation principles. All the staff understand this is exactly what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. And this runs all the way up to our senior team. Well, up, right up anyway to the 21s, I'd imagine, at the moment. And obviously, Stephen now in the senior team. Um, move on a little bit quick. This is how we want to play. This is, this is our mantra. We want to control the game and establish good possession. So we will use our free players. We'll show you some clips now in a second. Um, we will try switch play. We will try to create overloads in the middle tour there. Uh, looking for penetrating passes and runs from the middle. But ultimately then, when we get up to the final tour, obviously we're trying to score goals. That's the aim of the game. But for players now, the individual skill set, just to express themselves, 1v1 dribbling, um, taking on players, you know, combinations, quick combinations in the final tour. Let them just really express themselves. For our job, especially at the younger age, is get them to control the game from the back, establish good possession and create overloads right into the midfield. That's what we're trying to achieve. And every training session we do will have this type of information in it. Okay. Um, the attacking principle. principles of play, yeah. yeah. So again, we would work through this on all of our sessions. We might have a focus on attacking and transition to defend in one session, and then defend and transition to attack in the next set where we build into it. But all of our attacking principles come right the way through the emerging talent program up into this, where you're trying to create as much space as possible for players to receive. That's creating width and depth, breaking it right back down to the PDP ones and PDP twos that you learn from it. Can they create their own little passing angles? The distances that they create are massive. Um, can we try and create more space for players to receive the ball? The more space you're in, then the better opportunity to go and create those overloads that you can have by using that free man. When you build through the different areas of the pitch then, so once we've got an established good control of the football, you then break into the next third where you're trying to actually try and penetrate. So we would do an awful lot of work on the inside run movements, um, breaking lines to try and make sure the players understand the spaces they should try and play in. And then you're looking at shifting opposition to one side of the pitch, possibly, to then exploit the far side of the pitch, which will show a couple of highlights of that as well. But again, the main idea is that you don't always go towards the ball. So at younger ages, players play with freedom. A lot of them will be in towards the football. At this age group now, they've got to start understanding that sometimes the best thing to do when you're attacking is to play away from the ball. Play on the shoulder of the opponent. Scan and be aware of the area around you so that you then can help to actually try and switch the play. So you're not bringing an extra defender in on top of yourself. And again, with all attacking, you've got to then be aware that you're not just leaving yourself wide open and going, going how forward. Again, the attacking elements on the, on the other side there, you've got to have tempo. So the higher level that these players are used to playing that week in, week out, the bigger the challenge for them playing in National League clubs against top class opposition week in, week out, the higher intensity, the higher tempo that that's going to actually bring to their game when they step up to international football. When you bring intensity, you've then got to have this switch that you've got to be able to say, right, now I've got to be calm on the ball. Because if you're panicking and the ball is hitting off, you're not going to control it. Your actions with the ball aren't going to be as good. But you've got to then go and try and make sure you're creating the right option, communicating it well, and make sure, obviously, you can execute it after you've made your decision. Again, it says there, there you go to create space. So that's up in your shoulder. 1v1 alternatives. If you look at training straight down to the lowest levels, 
1v1s in training sessions in little small cages are absolutely vital. Can you hold off a defender? Can you spin a defender? Can you drop the shoulder? Can you create an extra yard of space for yourself? The smaller areas you do that in from a younger age, the better you're at it and the less touches you'll end up taking. If possible, can you scan to be able to actually move inside as a winger, understand not being in the same line with anyone else and be able to turn towards the goal as possible, which is usually what we would call the, the grassroots, PDPs, is taking the ball on the back foot. Such simple information that can help build them up to under 50 international. Throughout the last number of years, Richie would have done an awful lot of work. The goalkeepers are vital to be able to play up in the back. They're an extra player on the pitch. You look at Neuer a couple of years ago, revolutionised how goalkeepers play. We are so lucky in this country now that we have goalkeepers that are great with their feet. And again, they express themselves probably as much better forward. Obviously, mistakes happen, but that's the environment that Jason's created for all of us. It's called, you've got to overcome those, but again, it's a no-fear attitude. Try the things, it might not work, but then we learn from it together. Again, always try and play forwards, but if it's not on, we just keep the ball and play backwards. Again, try and make sure, can we penetrate and break lines? For players we have to create overloads going forward, better chance we have a scoring goal, which ultimately is what we want to do now. So, uh, sorry, Gar. Yep. So basically all that information there is air session plans. So air session plans are actually words. It's, it's, the, it's the detail that we try to put onto our pitch sessions. So when you, when you look at this here, when you look at this here, we're talking about the session plans organization. It's, it's about positions on the pitch. It's about those principles we've just discussed. And it's about key objectives in terms of our game plan. Um, we always try to put our players in, in, in positions they're going to get repetition in. It has to be position specific. That will bring them on. We record every training session we do and we watch them all back and in the individual one-to-one -one in terms of how we manage, we measure performance. We would sit down with the, with the players and show them individual clips. Um, plus, it will help them in terms of reality-based conditioning on the pitch. So if we're in smaller numbers or bigger numbers, we have to have the four functions of the game. So, we, you know, we, we won possession of the ball. Now you have to speed up the pitch, try to break, or we just lost the ball. Can you recover straight back? So we try to make sure all the elements of the game is in every training session we do. Mm. The objective is position specific for the players because we're going, you know, a lot of these players will go on and hopefully represent the country numerous times. But some of them might stop at 15 and 16. Yeah. But the problem is we want them to not just, you know, understand how to play as a team but understand their specific role when they play for the club team as well so if I'm playing a right back what's expected of you a left back and so forth um, make sure the environment is safe we discuss that about Q&A all the time you know the, the, even player to player on the pitch we encourage uh, player to player to discuss the, their, their positions on the pitch um, and we obviously we try to keep their confidence up but listen just a quick video here um, just a quick video, just in terms, before I go on to the defender, I want to show you and then I'll come up. So the last video we're going to show is going to outline everything we're talking about in terms of our attacking principles. This would be us just in terms of our defensive principles, which I will allude to in a second. So this would be against England, just four or five little snippets of how we try to play defensively. So... We see they play a 4 1 4 1. We want to prevent them turning. We want to force them down the side. So important that Caden tries to keep him on side. Joe can't let him turn out there. Adam's ready to travel now. We pinned him in. Now we've got, now we've an overload of 5v3 there, 5v4, and we've got the sideline as well as cover. So we cut off the pitch. This is a great clip where we're 4v6 against us. So Joe makes a decision. He sees he can't get pressure on the ball. Drop off. We stay compact as a team. Everyone ready to go as the ball is travelling. The key information. The ball is travelling. Now we get there. We win it. And now we're in that position to break. And this is where we're talking about expressing yourself in that 1v1. We lose the ball here. Good defending. But it's the decision making of to make sure we push them to the side of the pitch. Little move to the side. Straight passes, which are easier to defend. And if you look at that clip, we have a 4v2 overload now. 
and we have the sideline of the pitch, doesn't know what to do, and we win a throw in. Just nearly finishing there. Now you're looking to, we defend defending three or five lanes, which I'm going to go to in a second. There we are, nice and tight and compact. And this is again, we just, we just lose the ball here. The wingers become a narrow. If you look at Kevin, who circled, getting really narrow now, playing on the blind side of the centre back, ready to adapt. We scored three goals this year doing this. Kevin comes inside, scores the tour goal. And we're out. So the key, the key defensive principles that we're talking about there, we try to make sure it is in all our training sessions. So that's just a quick snipper of them there. Uh, we would use different processes. We have words, we have videos. We're also, we would show them maybe a PowerPoint like so. So this is one we're talking about, team principles, communication, decision making, execution. How do you work as a unit individual? The ball moves, we might move with the ball, force them out to the fullback, block off that side of the pitch as you see it. Now we've trapped them to the side. But that's, that's only one scenario. When you're playing the top coaches, against the top coaches and players in the world, they problem solve. So the next time now, so if you just look up top, that's build up one, the store build up one. The next time now, these coaches now will realise they won't play that pass now because they're going to get trapped. So they might play a longer pass. So we would cover the scenario what might happen. And then maybe a tour scenario, they might start trying to play into the striker. So how do we get around or the switch of play and get ourselves compact as a team all the time? So we would go through some videos, videos like that, some visuals like this, and we would make sure the players understand their role, which leads us to this. After every training session, every game, Sean might walk into this a little bit. Yeah, so we'll go to the player-to-player -player reflection. Um, I think this is an area where we get the players to discuss positioning. So as Jason just touched on there with the video, I'm a big fan of the video work. So we might show them a game that have just played in and then we'll talk about centre-backs. We'll ask one of the centre-backs, what do you think about the right-sided centre-backs position? Where can he be? Then I might move on to the position of the defensive midfielder. How can the defensive midfielder help you? What do you need to do? Do you need to communicate? Do you need to get him to scream? Does he maybe need to drop into the middle of the two centre-backs, possibly? Um, so we try and get feedback from the players. And then also, um, what we do, we'll have the, the group meeting. So we might have a team meeting, but I personally think that the, the unit meetings are a better way of, of getting interaction between the players. Um, if I go back to when I was a senior player, when I was in a team meeting, I didn't necessarily want to speak in front of 20 players. But if I was doing a unit meeting where it was just the defenders, the goalkeeper, maybe the defensive midfielder, I would have more of a voice. Um, and so I think this is really important that we, you know, we take down the numbers because some, some players are inverted, some are extroverted. Um, and so, you know, when there are the unit meetings, the player who is introverted may then have a voice. And so then, you know, that's the player growing, he's starting to communicate. And then we'll show scenarios of possibly the best centre-backs in the world, Van Dijk. What does Van Dijk do? How can you relate to Van Dijk? Um, then we'll obviously go over the games. We'll show them clips. But I just think that, you know, the feedback from the players and it's, it's drawing the answers from the players. So it's not me giving the answers. You know, I'm asking the questions to the players to draw it from them so they can find the solutions themselves because as coaches... I fully believe that we have to know the answers because the top players, the intelligent ones, they'll want to ask questions. And if you don't know the answer as a coach, you know, ask someone else, research on the internet, and then we'll continue to develop as coaches. But for me, it's majorly important that we have the answers for these players. And I think that, you know, we've spoken, we've highlighted again, that it's all about communication, interaction, um, and we can all help each other. And then I think it leads on to um, the coach reflection in the one-to-ones, I think, which Will is going to speak about now. Yeah, the, the self-reflection part of it, we would do a lot of work throughout the week on that through the player learning journal that the players probably don't realise what they're actually inputting into it. So at the start, they would set their goals. 
we would have information of what happens every single day. But after every day, they do a little reflection on what they've learned through the day. So with the training session or whether we did a tactically based analysis, they have to write in what they now think are their roles and responsibilities going forward. <clears throat> every morning when we will go through that information, we can then see what the players know. So if the players have wrote down that they understand a certain point of it, that's fantastic. We will then obviously see that, well, maybe one player needs a little bit of help. That's where we as coaches need to go and identify that during the possible training session we have or prior to a game, that they then understand the little role and responsibility that they have for that game. Coming towards the end of the week, then we flip it and give them the self-reflection part of it, where they will go through a little SWOT analysis of themselves, so their strengths, their weaknesses, what opportunities they have going forward, and what the threats are that could prevent them from achieving what their ultimate goals are. So at the end of the week, they will have a little SWOT analysis completed of themselves in the player learning journal, which they all get, and also their own performance improvement goals. So they will have their own personal improvement goals at the end of the week to go and work on when they go back to their national league clubs, when they're working individually on their own. But they have a specific plan then to say, well, this is what the next target is. They want to be in the next Say, for example, when we were finished in Spain, they wanted to go to Italy with us. When they finish in Italy, they want to have the next, obviously, goal is to go and get into the first squad with Paulo Zamet under 16. Level. But that's all part of their self They understand how they're actually going to continue to achieve that. And then Jason, obviously, coaches, which he'll speak about now when he passed on the information. So, us as coaches, we will give reflection after every game to the players in the one-to-one -one as well, but also when they leave the camp. Um, then I will get in touch with the director of coaches at whatever club they're in and give some feedback then just in terms of where we see that he has to work on before the next event. So the communication is always good between the player to the coaches, the coaches to the club. So everything we're doing is trying to improve that player's performance, getting the max, maximising his performance the best we possibly can. Um, and that's, that's the important part of the, how we measure our performance here. Does the parents fit into that picture at all? Um, not necessarily. Some of the parents would phone me and ask them for feedback, but I prefer giving feedback to the coaches because the coaches are the one who's going to be implemented on the training ground. Okay. Uh, where the parents won't be. But if parents, I give feedback to parents just in terms of his general behavior, his eating habits, his nutrition, and how we can improve certain aspects of that. But anything got to do on the pitch will go back to the clubs. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do, we're just going to finish here. So we've got a little video here, Gar. And, and the way we want to word this video is, it's for coaches between the ages of 8 to 15, 8 to 16. We've done some clips here at international level that is an individual skill set, but that can be done for grassroots between 8 and 12 year old before they graduate to National League. And the idea of this is, we know you don't have a full pitch. We know you might only have small cages, but you can do certain practices, certain rondos, but it's the key information we're going to give you here that fits into those rondos that you're doing. So we have a little video that we're going to go through. So, for example, against two strikers here, we would swing to a three. So if you have a look at the centre-back now, he's created a clear pass line between the two strikers. So it's so important. We've still got that 4v2 there. Now we've got them to one side, switch play. But now we've taken seven out of the game because we were comfortable to receive under pressure and we could switch play. Little overloads created the far side of the pitch. And these are all practices that can be done in small rondos and drills and transfer practices. So it's just in terms of how they expressing themselves in the 1v1 in the, in the area, three men in the box, three men in the box, and obviously got support players behind just to counter the counter-attack and if it, uh, exactly as it does pick up the second play. This is one that we need to work on in grassroots. Be able to receive under pressure, be calm. Are we doing enough of this in our training? Now we've switched it out. We've sixed them out of the game. The pass here, get the weight of the pass on front of the centre-back. Look at James' run. James needs to check his run here. Great little visual. Checks his run. Now he receives it on the back foot. These relevant details. Now we can go and break lines going forward. Yeah, now we're moving into this one. Another 4v2 rondo that you can do in the cages or possibly a 3v1. Important for the defensive midfielder to receive with his back to goal. Now we're talking about the execution of the pass. Maybe the wrong decision, but as he develops, he might be able to execute it. Again, we talk about the goalkeeper's composure 
maybe put a goalkeeper in the possession drill because it's very important he's good with his feet. He plays the free man. Now the wing back is caught in the half space. He comes out. Simple pass. Now the defensive midfielder's on the ball. Now that pass to the left forward's on. Now once we get into this position, what we're we looking for for the strikers, 1v1, express themselves. Again, just look at the wide forward. He's scanning play, checking for the space. He receives on his back foot, 1v1, positive. Now he's double marked 2v1. Where's the space? Good movement by the centre forward, playing behind. Now he's in a very similar scenario to the last one. Express yourself, 1v1. You know, let the dribblers play. They excite people. This one yeah, here, patience. patience here to, to be calm in possession against two centre forwards. Can we go and break lines, making a good decision to get the ball into wide areas? Again, we've created a 2v1, a 3v1 in that area of the pitch. can all be done through little rondos and small cages. Again, can we go and break and make good decisions? So now you can see, getting on the football, where is the space? Where is the best option to go and create 1v1s? And now when you come across the pitch, the timing and execution of the pass now when the fullback joins in, gets on the football, and then can we now see the winger getting into a wide area? Again, easily done in a small little area, work on your space to create that 1v1. Again, the quality then of the winger, taking on the player, can he go and get a good end product into the box? This is the England game. We tip off by all on one side. Now the key is about clear passing lines, Garrett. So we're looking for the coaches and clear passing lines, all the practice. Receive, turning away from players all the time, making those triangles on the pitch, as you see up the top right-hand side. Play, if you have a look at that pitch, you're playing between the lines. Centre-back has an option to drive in there. He doesn't. Full-back does quite well, to be fair. Little combination, which we're saying about creating and penetrating. Little run from the 10 here, which is just broke the lines, that penetrating run. Drags in the, the full-back, which frees up our left-back. AWT. The accuracy of the pass, weight of the pass and the timing could be a little bit better. But the skill set of Kevin to finish up in a 1v1 is fantastic. Just have a look at this. There's a little rondo practice in a cage or when you bring it into a bigger game. Just cleared pass and lines all the time. Checking his run. New position all the time. Ball moves, we move. Triangles are formed everywhere. These can all be done for grassroots coaches to build a skill set. 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12 year olds. Then they come to National League. We still work on that, but we can now work on uh, a more me, me on the bones in terms of the position specific in, in a team environment and the game plan. I prefer the early cross here we had a chat with because he takes a touch, allows him to get back. So these are clips we would have showed the players. Yeah, again, you'll see the triangles being formed with the defensive midfielder pivot, finding the free man. We're moving the ball from side to side. We're trying to move the opposition lines. Again, Good pass out to the right back, nice and composed. Triangles again, great awareness. Defensive midfielder always scanning, okay? Intelligent play here from the forward. He recognises he might not get the ball, but he moves inside to allow the left back the space. As you can see, 4v4 now arriving into the box. Again, triangles, okay? Good angle from the pivot. Continually scanning, find the free man. Good depth from the centre back. Maybe wanting to drive in. Good pass into the wide player. Good protection of the ball. Good. Composed. Move the ball. Good play from the pivot. Unfortunately, we lose the ball. What do we do? Counter press. You know, you can do this to four functions. We always try to include counter pressing in it. Structure behind the ball. Force him the long pass. Now we regain possession. So again, sometimes we're forced to play long. And again, you can see the triangles are created when we win the ball back, freeing up the free centre back to get on the football. But again, you're looking at his decision making. Again, playing the pass forward if we can, penetrating, still creating those tri uh, triangles in the midfield area. As we try and progress through the lines, obviously trying to penetrate those blindside runs to free up the player. And then can we get in behind and try and get some shots away on goal? Again, the decision, accuracy, weight, time of the pass, maybe a little behind them which stops the run of the player and, again, has to cut inside to get that shot away. Again, this one, can we get the free centre-back on the football? 
the centre midfielder and this midfield six playing away from the ball. So we can see he comes towards the ball a little bit, then realise the space that he's created elsewhere, checks his shoulder, scans, and then he drops in so that he's able to actually go and get on the football and switch the play if it's on. This time he's pressed, but unfortunately he gets away with the pass because Sam makes it look a better pass than it probably was. You can see the two players, Justin and Kevin, then in the same line. Kevin notices that as the player behind and comes on the inside then to try and create the overload in the middle of the pitch where there's space. And then it's just a little bit of execution wasn't great for the final ball through for the right winger to run on to. Quick combinations, anything in the middle of the final tour, quick combinations, quick play like you see. Uh, this is a great clip. This is another one. 3v1 practice at home, turning away from defenders. So it's communication with the opposition, turning away. Have a look at him now. So Justin just turned away, took three players out. He's supporting the play. He's going to be highlighted now. Watch his movement now. He doesn't come near the ball once. And this is fantastic. He's adjusting his positions. And these are all little, little, uh, little rondos, little small side of games we can do before we go into team tactical stuff. He's moving away. Now we have a 2v1. Now he's in behind. We penetrate. He gets a shot off. Yeah, I think we'll look at this clip here. Great protection from Kevin. He sees the, the switch of play. Can you execute it? The whip created by the wide player and a very good pass. And now we've moved up the pitch into the attacking final third. Again, triangles. You know, we want composure from our centre-backs. I think we're winning the game at this point. Make the opposition chase the ball. Move them. Again, triangles, as you can see, with a double pivot this time. Good composure. Where's the space? Move the ball backward. Be nice and patient. Recycle. Again, we're working the opposition. Good feet from the goalkeeper. The width from the centre forward, you can see. Possibly the defensive midfielder may not need to come to the ball. But as you can see, centre-back gets his head up. And it's a fantastic pass and take by the wide player. Another triangle here again, the pivot, maybe turn out, he doesn't, we go backwards, but it's composure. Again, when you look at this clip, we're bringing them all to one side of the pitch, stay calm, being able to receive in a 1v1 and the quality of pass, the quality of pass to the far side of the pitch. This one to me sums us up perfectly in terms of decision making. If you have a look at this one, he's got three options. But he also realises his fourth option is, is, is the free player, which is second centre-back. Cottle, tremendous pass from Cottle, stretches the opposition. Now we've got a 3v3 at the goal. An early cross here for me. He takes a touch and we, we get a corner over. But an early cross there was probably what we should have been looking for. But they're just snippets, uh, they're just snippets, Cara, of, of basically sort of the training sessions we would do, the style of play that we would do in terms of our attacking system. Um, the, the message I want to get across is, yes, we do work team tactically, information on bigger pitches. But if you're, if you're working with players and between the ages of 18 to, 8 to 15, I would say make sure you develop an individual skill set. Can they receive under pressure? Are they good on 1v1s? When you're doing your rondos, clear passing lines. Do you receive it on your left foot or your right foot, depending where the opposition is? So that will help improve the communication between the players and the opposition. It will also help his decision-making of where to turn. And then obviously the execution in terms of, do I pass with my left foot or my right foot? Do I dribble? Do I pass? Do I penetrate? Run? So all this information is key for me. And that's what I wanted to bring into the assignment, if that's okay. We had a chat of staff. Uh, we played a game last year against Hungary, and they played a 1-4-4-2 diamond. So what we would look for in terms of the CPD assignment, obviously there's three hours on offer for your CPD. I'd like all the coaches to do it. It doesn't have to, do, not just your way for qualified coaches, all coaches. It's a learning experience for everybody. We will offer some feedback individually to everybody. Um, I want them to analyze our 1433 with those principles they've just seen against the 1442 diamond. I want them to look at strengths and weaknesses and then devise two training sessions which have 80 minutes duration. Now, the team of the session, so if team one is attacking with transition, I want them to start from the warm-up, where it might be a rondo, or they might be working on small elements, tactical elements, which they want to achieve 
as they move up through the session to 11 v 11. And then obviously the second session, then working on defending with transition. So, you know, it's against the diamond. Where if they in overload? Um, where, how are we going to stop their overload wherever it is on the pitch? So it, it's a good assignment for players to do a little bit, for our coaches to do a bit of researching. Uh, do you have a full week to do it? I, I don't need it till Saturday, um, the following Saturday, which would be the 20th, I think, Gary. Is that right? Um, email it to me directly on Jason Dunhu at FEI.ie. It's there. Um, and if you've any further questions about the assignment, just email me anyway sometime throughout the week. Just for the coaches out there, what we need to consider when we're planning our sessions, make sure position-specific learning is in place. The, co the, the players on the pitch understand their roles and the KPI is what you expect from them. Um, you've got to consider the abilities and age of the players as well. Don't make it too hard for them. You might start simple and then just make it more challenging as it goes along. Um, obviously, the elements of the game should be in place, so the four functions and the actions within that. Um, universal football language in terms of the communication, decision-making and execution process. You make sure that is in as many sessions as you can because that will help the players uh, make the right decision at the right time when they cross the white line. Um, obviously, adaptations to your practice. You know, you might start with rondos or small games like we do, but we will fi finish on 11 v 11 practices or 9 v 9 practices. So the players can implement the key learnings from the start to finish. And obviously just have everything there in terms of your training equipment that you need, how you're going to use it and um, your time duration. Allow plenty of time for them to play, but not just play a game, just make sure what they're implementing in the game is exactly what you're trying to achieve as your objective. Thanks, Car. Very good. Thanks, lads. Thanks, uh, thanks to Jason, to Will, and to Sean. Um, really brilliant stuff uh, there across what, what's happening at under 15s uh, Republic of Ireland team, but also really good stuff for coaches at all levels to pick up on and uh, a really interesting assignment there to cap it all off. Um, we'd love to kind of get some feedback from you guys, so feel free to leave comments. Uh, on social media and Facebook and Twitter. But make sure to su subscribe to FEI TV on YouTube. Uh, thanks very much for watching this webinar.